This episode of the Pain Education Corner is sponsored by the Camella Foundation. The Camella Foundation is committed to relieving pain naturally using osteopathic healing principles. Here at the Camella Foundation, we envision a world where people achieve their maximum potential by being empowered with knowledge and skills to heal themselves and others. This information is to be used for educational purposes only and not to be construed as medical advice. If you have any questions or concerns, please consult a licensed healthcare professional. Hello, it's Bill, the Knee Pain Guru, and welcome to the Pain Education Podcast. And we have a very special guest today. Her name is Sarona Rameka. Rameka, did I pr- pronounce that correctly? Rameka. Rameka. Okay. <laughs> well, S- Sarona has an absolutely amazing story. Uh, we were speaking right before I started, and I told her, I can't promise I won't cry. <laughs> so uh, she's just got an amazing story about what happened to her in her life where she ran into incredible challenges uh, with uh, cancer and the pain that she went through to be with us and share her story today. So Sarona, I want to thank you so much for be here for being here and um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Would, would you share your story? I mean, I think that's going to be so powerful for the listeners. Yes, right. So um, four and a half years ago, I was 37 and I was one week out from giving birth. And the whole third trimester of my pregnancy, I was feeling a lot of pain in my chest. And it was kind of like a stabbing pain when I was breathing. And I went to the doctors a few times and every time they sent me home saying that it was um, just baby pressing on my diaphragm. And as it was my first birth baby, I just, I was thinking pregnancy must be awful. (laughs) How are all these ladies doing it? And just that I was being a wee bit dramatic. Um, And then one week out, it was, it was unbearable. Like I was in tears and my husband and I, we had some teenage kids at home and they got home from school and, and they were really concerned. I couldn't lie down. I could hardly talk. And so we went into A&E and again, the doctor was going to send me home. And my midwife came in. She said, I'm, I'm really not happy with baby's heartbeat. So um, they admitted me and they did a scan and found a shadow um, on the left hand side of my chest so I didn't know what a shadow was nobody knows you know what a shadow is and the doctors just were very vague they looked shocked and they just wanted to get out of there so we were transferred to two other hospitals and the last one they did a CT scan and found that those shadows were tumors and they covered um, my left lung my um, heart and they were in my chest and the largest one measured over 16 centimetres. So wow. combined, they were um, the size of a small rugby ball. And I mean, if you can imagine, this was meant to be the happiest time um, in our lives. And it just, in a matter of days, turned into the scariest. So we, um, we had a big team of doctors. There were about 15 to make sure that baby came out properly and that the tumours didn't Um, burst into my uh, chest or heart and we gave birth to a beautiful healthy baby girl Um, both of us had to spend a wee bit of time in in intensive care but yeah she she was a miracle like just the fact that she survived that and grew through that Mm -hmm. Um, and then we were tasked with this gigantic um, cancerous tumor which was in my chest so I did have a biopsy before I left hospital and uh, um, we found out that it was malignant and it was stage four. So um, a few weeks after we had our first oncologist appointment and it, it wasn't good. Um, they offered palliative chemo and that was it. So mm. he said it was incurable and palliative would just be to give me more time, um, maybe a matter of months and really 
we had to think about if it was worth it for the quality of life. Um, now, prior to becoming pregnant, when I was 26, if we backtrack a little bit, I was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune condition. And what that does is, oh, without medication, it would stop the link between my nerves and my muscles. And my immune system starts attacking that link or the muscles, and then they just they get weaker and weaker. So without meds over a few days, I would lose speech. I'd, I would um, lose the use of like my speech, um, my smile, my hands, my limbs would get really weak. And at its worst, it would affect the breathing and swallowing. Um, and so for 11 years, I'd been on medication to suppress the immune system. And that myasthenia was under control. And so a few days after the oncologist, I had my neurologist, Dr. Matthew Phillips. And I almost canceled that appointment because I was saying to my husband, what's the point? You know, we've, we've got cancer to deal with. Um, but my husband made, made us keep it. And so we go and see Matt. And Matt was really shocked. And then he said, well, what are you doing about it? And we said, well, um, I had prayed a lot. I'm I'm a child of God, and as soon as we had the diagnosis, I was just digging deep into um, into prayer, and God gave me a word all the time. He would give me passages from um, people in different areas of the country, and it was always the same one, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans for you, um, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. So in my heart, I knew that there was a way to get through this and I just needed a medical strategy. And so Vern and I, well, my husband, we were looking at the alkaline diet and we only found that online. We had um, no real clarity or information because lots of the lists, they were contradictory, but we started it nonetheless because we had nothing. So mm. I said to Matt, I'm doing the alkaline diet, but I'm looking for something else while we consider chemo. And then Matt started talking to us about fasting and the ketogenic diet. So he was doing a keto diet. He was testing it, um, doing clinical trials for keto and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's patients. He couldn't find anyone to fast, <laughs> but he had read he had read a lot about it. And because Vern and I had been praying so much that doors would open and doors would close, Matt was just he was answered prayer. Mm -hmm. And so that day we said, yes, I'm in. And he, he just offered straight away. He said, I'll help you with whatever you need. Um, here's my number. Here's, here's a nutritionist, another colleague of mine that I work with. And he, he called her on the spot. I met with her um, the following week. And immediately, uh, the day after I met Deb, Deb Ramuto, I started a 10-day water fast. Mm. Um, and so the idea was that um, the ketogenic diet would starve the cancer of its fuel source which is glucose but of course I mean it's cancer with a big C so cancers can adapt and it's not that easy but it's the fasting that really puts the pressure on and so the difficulty with that is because I had the myasthenia gravis and I was on pills for so long to suppress the immune system the whole point of fasting was to um, boost the immune system so that the immune system would fight the cancer mm -hmm. so we were in a catch-22 because as soon as I started the fast three days into it I relapsed so badly in the myasthenia that I ended up in hospital mm -hmm. and I had to have a blood transfusion so because we weren't sure what the blood transfusion was going to do, um, Matt extended the fast another two days. So my first fast was purely water for 12 days. Um, oh. And it really did knock me around. Like I, I lost the speech. My husband was taking care of me. My parents had turns at living with us for the whole first year to look after our baby so that mm. Vern could look after me. And um, it was working though. The first 
CT scan after that fast, we saw that the tumor had reduced in size by 20%. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And cool. so, <laughs> yeah, stop yeah. what you want, I'll just keep going. Um, I, yeah, I, like, I, what kind of time frame between the birth of your child and all this is going on? What, give us a, an idea, we, weeks, months, where are we um, at? It, it was, um, I think it was six weeks after Pip's birth. Okay. Yeah, so we had our first um, oncology appointment four weeks after the birth, mm -hmm. and then everything moved really quickly from there. Mm -hmm. And what was it like? Because I, I want to get into the, the psychological state, because everything, you're, you're just kind of sharing, which I appreciate. However when you find out this information and you have this reality, you have this, all this well of emotion from the birth of your child. And now you're given this not very long to live. What is going through your mind? What was your experience? So it was a real, it was a real mixed bag. Mm -hmm. um, and it had extreme highs of joy because um, every time, every time we prayed or every time we refocused, it was all about the miracle of Pep. And um, we were just overwhelmed with amazement at her. And so I would go and see her in newborn intensive care. And that was my sanctuary. Every time I was with her, it was just beautiful and peaceful. But whenever I left there, I was overwhelmed by fear. And um, I really do mean overwhelmed. Um, it was horrible being in my hospital room. It was horrible. If I, if I go back to um, before she was born, that fear was really overwhelming for all of us as well because we didn't understand the hospital jargon. We didn't know what the doctors were talking about. You know, a shadow or tumors or we you don't even know if that's cancer and mm. or what cancer could do or you know do you just be on medication and it goes is it that easy um and of of course yeah it's just a lot to process and there was a lot going on and much of the time I would wake up and go to the mirror and close my eyes really tight and try and wake up again like mm. I was hoping that it was a dream mm. and it was, it was a really hard reality every day, realizing that it wasn't a dream. Um, so I used to try and go to Niku as much as I could, because that was my only time of peace. And when I was in mm. my room and not with Pip, my baby, it was, it was just thinking about dying Mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to be there to see her grow up and it was consuming um, and it was just hard to find peace or clarity when there was so much um, that I didn't know mm -hmm. um, so that was in the hospital mm -hmm. when I came out of hospital it didn't get much better um, because we we knew that it was bad we didn't ask for a time so once I had the scriptures, um, you know, for hope in a future, mm -hmm. I chose to believe that I was just going to walk by faith. And, um, and that was it. If I heard a time from the specialist or from the oncologist, I knew that it would have subconsciously just played out in my mind. Yeah. So the first meeting that we had, um, my husband, as soon as we walked in the door, he said, um, Hi, you know, we're Vernon and Serona. During this meeting, you cannot give us a time. Mm -hmm. And um, the oncologist was a bit taken back by that. And he's like, you know, lots of people, they want to know so that they can prepare things. And mm -hmm. we're like, you cannot give us a time. Um, mm -hmm. And so he agreed to that. We, we found out later that it was less than, um, less than 12 months is what he wrote in the report. Wow. Um, and we think that he was guessing about six months because there was it was my second visit and he said 
that he wouldn't see us because he was going on sabbatical um, mm-hmm. and had to see us when he got back. And then he goes, oh, well, and then he touched my hand. <laughs> so we, we knew it wasn't good. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, um, the feelings and the emotions, it was all fear all the time. And I just, I'm very blessed to have, to have gotten through that. And I only did because I was surrounded with people who stood with us in faith as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would see Pip as much as I could. She was my bucket fill. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that, that's just intense. I just, the, the fear, I mean, the, the, the range of emotion you, you must have experienced was just unbelievable. Like the roller coaster, the high of seeing your daughter, the low of the fear of your own mortality. It yeah. must have been incredibly intense. And is there, what, and I, and I appreciate you talking about going by faith, but in those times, it's so easy to want to give up and so difficult to want to move forward. What was that piece for you, the, the mental component that kept that drive going? It was only faith, Bill. Only faith. Um, yeah. We, we had what I call, um, I call them kisses from heaven. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what, what that means is almost every day we had something that was too good to be a coincidence happen, mm. Um, mm. either to myself or Vern. And we kept listing them we kept a book and we kept talking about it because I guess the scariest thing is um, I would just look at Pip and think I wasn't going to be here or I I wasn't going to be a wife to Vern and the only hope that I had was that scripture and if I doubted that God existed then I doubted that scripture And then I doubted the ability for me to be healed. Mm -hmm. And so every day when we would have these beautiful little things happen to us or people bless us, um, it was just a reminder for me that, and I would be really down, you know, my life was not at all in a good space, but it was a pick me up, you know, like I've I've got to keep going. I just Mm -hmm. have to hold on and I'll get through this. Um, and I had everything to fight for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was going to um, fight. Cool. Yeah. Um, and your your daughter um, through this process, she she did awesome. Or uh, like, how did that go? What what was yeah, that well, like? She came out of um, uh, Niku after like a week, and um, when we got home, we got home two weeks later. And we were surrounded by love. Like my parents were up all the time. They were bringing friends up. Our house was always full. Um, And Vern and I, we had a real battle to go through. So for the first year, um, my myasthenia symptoms were really extreme. And Mm -hmm. every time I fasted, it was a reminder that I was sick. Um, It was very difficult for me physically. So... Therefore, it was very difficult for everyone in our house. And because they had to see that, right? And the other thing that we did is I turned down chemo. So um, the reason I did that is on the second oncology appointment, I asked the oncologist what the chances were. And he said none. In hindsight, I really appreciate that because if I had a little bit of hope, I think I definitely would have taken it. And things Uh, could be very different. Um, Yeah. So he said no. And that closed the door for us. And it really scared my parents. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, what are you doing? If you get cancer, you do chemo. You get, you know, like that's the only 
um, cancer treatment there is. Mm -hmm. And you're saying no to that. And then all they could physically see was I was fasting, but I was getting the sickest I've ever been. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's really hard for the people that were close to us to see that and then have the same faith that we did, mm -hmm. but everything physically looked terrible. Sure. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of the Pain Education Corner. If you have a special talent or skill to relieve pain and you'd like to become a guest on our show, visit us at thecamellafoundation.org forward slash interview. Help us spread the word on eliminating pain and suffering in the world. That's thecamellafoundation.org forward slash interview. And how did that, so you're fasting, uh, Dr. Phillips was, uh, have you, has you on this ketogenic diet, you're doing water fasts on a regular basis. Uh, you're going through this, uh, this experience with your body as it's transitioning because yeah. you, you were saying yeah. that the, the tumor shrunk by 20, 20%, 25%, 20%, yeah. 20% in yeah. how long? What, what uh, was I'd say three months, three months um, was, that was the C, the next CT scan. Uh -huh. Um, that, that did change a bit though. I'll, I'll give you the very brief version of what sure. happened over the next few years. So we thought the blood transfusions were in part um yeah the the thing that caused the shrinkage um and so we doubled the blood transfusions and then the next ct scan uh found out that it grew back to its original size oh so that was you know when i talk about highs and lows they didn't just stop in hospital right uh, it's been the whole journey because then all the fear comes back and then i'm like did i make the right choice should we not do this? It's not working because I was still mm -hmm. fasting. Should I be, should I have chosen chemo? Um, so there's just a lot of emotion all the time. And so I carried on fasting. What we did was we doubled the fast. I, I was doing seven day water fast monthly. And then we pushed back the blood transfusion. So we were walking this tightrope too far this way. My senior would kill me. Too far this way, the cancer surely would. Um, but it was working. And after two years of doing that, we had no growth. It was it was just the same, or oh, two and a half years, and I was still alive. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a really bad turn. So the myasthenia, um, it just went nuts. Mm -hmm. I had diarrhea for six weeks. And I got down to 40 kgs. So I lost 15 kgs. And I ended up in ICU um, on a breathing ventilator. So I couldn't breathe by myself. I couldn't move. And the only thing that I could do is I could move my wrist. Mm -hmm. So I could write, but I couldn't move my head. My eyes were blurry. I could just hear and um, register everything, but nothing was working. And mm -hmm. they tried to pull out the ventilator twice and two times I failed. So I was three weeks and I see you on a ventilator, which is an extremely long stint. And the doctors sure. put on a do not resuscitate. And that was probably the lowest part in, in this whole journey is being being told that. And Vern and because I almost died going into ICU. I um they had to, yeah, if all of my organs shut down. So emergency came in and I mean it was quite horrific. Um, and Vern and Matt actually went into the doctor's meetings and they fought for me. They said, she's not going to die. It was, it was, uh, it was quite a significant um, leg in this journey. And so the doctors agreed that if I got through, um, oh, if this failed, the third attempt, then they would, um, they would resuscitate they would resuscitate me but as it turned out it worked and after three months in hospital I came home and I heard this rattling and then I went and had an x-ray 
and found out that it had shrunk by 96%. So wow. there was just a tiny speck. Um, and that was amazing. We were like, this is answered prayer. This is incredible. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then again, last October, like I, I didn't stop fasting, but I only fasted four days every couple of months. And then we found out it grew back to wow. 20%. So then I'm in this whole like, God, what? You you said yeah. that I would be healed. Yeah. Um, so same thing, I up the fast. So for the last year, I've been doing seven day water fasts every month and it hasn't grown. So I'm sitting at 20% and I'm still waiting for my miracle, believing mm -hmm. that one day it will be completely gone. Mm -hmm. But you no, know, until then I live a very good life. Mm. Wow. wow. Yeah, it's a lot. It's yeah. <laughs> I mean, just that whole, the, the faith piece and getting those cues from your body and using the medical model it to kind of gauge the CT scans to see, is this working or is this not working? And every, wow, that's just absolutely amazing. Um, I'm just blown away by, by your courage by your um fortitude i, I just it, it's amazing and i and i believe this the story that you shared is just a testament for others that are in places where the pain seems overwhelming the mental anguish can seem overwhelming the the doubt the fear the concern the worry all of that can be so overwhelming and just to pull in and mm -hmm. pull those people in that, that love you, that are there in your corner and, and bringing faith into the conversation to, uh, gosh, that's just, it's, uh, I'm honored to be talking with you today. It's just fantastic. Yeah. Like, I guess like on that note, um, one thing that I, I do need to say following up from that is it is really, really important to have a good group of people around you. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's friends and family. And it's also doctors. And what Vern and I found is there were 50 doctors that told us we were crazy. And mm -hmm. there were a few hospital stints where um, I would be visited by the hospital um, dietitian. They mm -hmm. always thought I had an eating disorder because I wouldn't eat the hospital food. Um, and there was a lot of judgment around that too. But then there was Matt, you know, and when I was, there was one time I was admitted into hospital and I could hear them talking about the crazy keto doctor. <laughs> so even in, even in hospital by his peers, he was kind of ridiculed as well. But it was just really important for us to um, shut off those people that we did that did not align with our beliefs. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the same with with friends. Like we actually closed off our friend group significantly because when we would talk to people, I saw fear and mm -hmm. I saw disbelief, and I just I couldn't do that. I couldn't I couldn't take it. And so just for a wee while, we just kept to a real small bubble of um, friends and our family members. I mean, mum and dad, they were scared that I wasn't doing chemo, but they stood with us nonetheless and they believed with us. And it was so important to have that because when I was low, I would just need everyone around me to say, this is okay, you can do this. Um, mm -hmm. You can fight through. Mm hmm yeah, I, I was literally having this conversation right before this interview. Uh, have you heard the story about crabs in a bucket? No, I haven't. Okay. If you go to the ocean, people who catch crabs, you can, you, if you put more than one crab in a bucket, you never have to worry about the crabs crawling out because when one crab tries to crawl out, the other crab will grab them and pull them back in. So as long as you have more than one crab in, a, in the bucket, all the crabs will be pulling the other crabs back down. Oh, wow. And 
And that's what happens many times is when we have a belief in something that we're, our heart is into, and we're going in a direction, the belief on how, for you, how you are going to approach your cancer. Like, this is what you were going to do. You had your support team. And anybody that wasn't aligned with that would be like the other crabs in the bucket pulling you down that it's like, it's not going to work. What are you doing? You crazy woman, you know, that kind of, kind of thing. And it's like, nope, we got to isolate ourselves and only hear that positive reinforcement of what you're doing. So gosh, good for you. Good for you. Yeah, That's so cool. So cool. And, And I, and I believe maybe you can give some advice here for someone who's listening that is in a precarious situation, who's in a difficult situation, and they may not have a supportive family. They may not have supportive friends. They may be going to the doctors and the doctors are telling them, you know, not, not positive things. How would you, how would you give them tips or what, what they could do in that situation? Well, my first advice to anyone is to pray um, because God is very real. And for me, it's about like when I was praying, it would always be that doors would open up and doors would close. And that's exactly what happened. And when it comes to doctors, I mean, you can't choose your family, right? But right. you can choose friends and support right. groups. Yeah, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of support groups out there now. Um, but when it comes to doctors, my advice there is if you don't feel in your heart like um, a doctor is giving you the best advice, um, you can change doctors. Mm-hmm. You know, like one thing that I learned in hospital, so I was, we were in like different wards, but they had a rotating neurologist every week. It would, mm-hmm. it would depend on who was on call. And so I went through, because we were in there a couple of months. So I went through like five different neurologists every week. Every single neurologist had a different opinion Mm -hmm. about what I should be testing, uh, tested about, what I should be doing, how long I was going to live for, you know. And people can specialize in one thing, but it's still just their opinions that they're giving you. So if you don't feel like a doctor is giving you the best advice for you, go and find a new doctor. Yeah. That great. I think that's great advice. And what I heard a diagnosis is just a professional opinion. That's when you right. get it, it really is. And doctors are human and yeah. they do make mistakes and it's only based on their, their training and their experience. Yeah. So they, yeah. they have, how many times have we heard doctors being wrong? Yeah. And it, it's not bad on them. It's just, recognizing that they're human as well and we can choose to the degree we want to choose to engage with them yeah that's right so and um there are things that we can always do as well like i i would never trust my life on one person's um advice to just do this um there are things that we can improve you know, with our own health. So I cut down on everything that was stresses to my life. So my my work stopped. I mean, you know, I had to stop it anyway because I couldn't work. But even when I was getting better, like now, um, I could work as much as I used to, which was a ridiculous amount, but I'm not going to because I Mm -hmm. know that that was stresses on my body. Mm -hmm. And I need to create an environment where sickness isn't encouraged to grow you know Mm -hmm. and so what that means for me it means for living a peaceful life um cutting back on on things that used to stress me out and managing my own emotions and anger and getting sleep and feeding my body well Mm -hmm. um so like keto isn't just for people who are sick my husband does it and he's he's really healthy He's healthier now. Um, fasting, you don't need to do the seven-day fast, but if you cut down on your meal intake and just did windows 
of eating, you're going to reduce inflammation. You know, mm-hmm. so there, you don't just need medication to be to be healthier. Mm-hmm. And so that's another piece of advice is that people don't just need to put everything into one doctor. Mm-hmm. They can look at, you know, what other areas in life they could improve on mm-hmm. for more you know, holistic. Yes. Now we're going to put um, the contact information for uh, Dr. Matthew Phillips was the doctor that you worked with, as well as your websites below in the description of this video on the Camella Foundation website. So if anyone would be interested, anyone watching could would be interested in reaching out to you or Dr. Phillips directly that they, they would be able to do so. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you do you work with clients? Do you take on clients or is that something that is, I'm just asking, no pressure either way. <laughs> well, um, I, I am a fasting coach with my local GP. He's got a, mm-hmm. um, a reversal clinic. It's about reversing things like type two diabetes through mm-hmm. metabolic therapy. Um, so I am on, I am on there as a fasting coach. Um, but, you know, if you go to my website in the treatments page, there's a keto book, which I um, wrote and designed, and that's for free to download. I originally made it for my mum, and then okay. everyone kept wanting it. So I'm like, oh, just put it out there for everyone. And then mm-hmm. there's videos of fasting, and there's like a list of how to fast. So pretty much that's all you need anyway. Mm-hmm. And Matt, my doctor, he's the same on his website. He's got his um, cookbooks and information about the keto diet because he's really busy with his own work. Um, And I guess what we both try or what Vern and I try and do is if people reach out and they want to catch up on Zoom, then Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Um, Mm -hmm. Because the information that I received from Matt and Deb Mm -hmm. um, and the time, you know, the time Matt gave us is incredible. He's one of our dearest friends now. Mm -hmm. But we can't take and then not give that out freely as well. Sure. So if anyone contacts me and needs help, the answer is always yes. And, and they can just reach me on email and we set up a Zoom and I might take them through the first fast and, you know, if they, they need to contact me, then they can. So that's, mm-hmm. that's really how I work. It's just for free and it's just to support others going through okay. their own journey. But, I mean, that information is on my website that people can just, download and and go through as well certainly well that's that's perfect we'll certainly have all of that information once again available down in the description below and how they can reach out and connect with you great that's that's awesome um sarona i want to is there anything else before i before we wrap this up is there anything else you would like to share final words no not not that I can think of. Um, well, that's I'm okay. Very, I'm very blessed to be alive, and it certainly has changed my appreciation of life and people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I could feel that. That's fantastic. So, Sarona, I want to thank you so much for sharing your time with us. It, it was an absolute honor for me to be able to interview you. This is fantastic for me. Oh, thank you, Bill. Um, so once again, all that information will be down below. Uh, thank you, Serona, for being here. This is uh, Bill Paravano, the Knee Pain Guru for the Pain Education Podcast on behalf of the Camella Foundation. Thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful day, and we will see you on the next one. Thank you for tuning into this week's segment of the Pain Education Corner. Join us next week for another conversation on natural healing methods to eliminate pain. To learn more about the work we do at the Camella Foundation, please visit our website at the Camella, C-O-M-E-L-L-A, foundation.org. Thank you.